Psalm 51 and 10 is one of my favorite scriptures. In fact, I pray it almost every day. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. I was reading the story about a young lady who was attempting to defend her attendance at some questionable amusements and some things that places she wanted to go. And she said to her Christian friend, she says, I feel like Christians should be able to go wherever they want to go and do whatever they want to do. And her friend said, certainly you can, but I'm reminded of a little incident which happened last summer when I went with a party of friends to explore a coal mine. She said one of the young women appeared in a dainty white gown when her friends told her that it was foolish thing to be wearing such a thing in this type of situation. She appealed to the old miner who was to be their guide that day, and she asked petulantly, can I wear a white dress down into that mine? And I found that his answer was very interesting because he said to her, yes, ma'am, there's nothing to keep you from wearing a white frock down there, but there will be plenty to keep you from wearing a white frock on the way back. When I heard that story and I thought about what her friend was trying to convey, what she was actually saying to her is that you have to understand that there are places that Christians can go and we can go anywhere we want to go. We can do whatever we want to do. But she was trying to help her understand to know this, that though we can go wherever we want to go and do whatever we want to do, there are some places that if we go there and some things that if we do them, they will not only stain our testimony, but they have the ability to stain our hearts. And as we have recently celebrated Valentine's Day, which is the holiday that speaks to the heart, I want to talk to you about the heart, about a healthy heart. For some time now, I've been asking God the question. I said, Father, why is it that it seems, and I look at the church these days, and so many of us, we really do love you. But why is it that we seem to so often live lives that contradict what we say we believe? And so I began to ask God this question, why is it that we love you so much today and yet there are so many Christians that are failing miserably to resist the temptations of the evil one and live holy lives consistently? And the Lord began to speak to me that it comes down to this, issues of the heart. We're living in a time where so many are, have such spiritual issues in their heart. You know, we've been talking about that on Sunday for the last couple of Sundays. We've been talking about how the spirit of worldly culturalism has so come in and infected the heart of many believers that we have heart conditions and don't even realize that we've been infected. In fact, I was thinking this morning that it was 38 years ago about this time I was in my first youth ministry, and my mother and father came to visit us in Connecticut. And I was downstairs doing the youth group. My mother was upstairs, and my father, and he was preaching in the service. And as he was preaching, all of a sudden, they called him to the back of the sanctuary. And my mother was back there. She was having a heart attack. What was interesting about it was that she showed no signs. She didn't look unhealthy, but she had a heart condition, even though you couldn't see it on the outside. I think that's a picture of the church today, that many of us look good on the outside, but we have heart conditions. Let me just talk about some of the realities of the heart. First of all, we need to understand that we all possess two hearts. The moment you became a Christian and you came into possession of two hearts, you received a new spirit heart, but you still were in possession of a carnal heart. The carnal heart, that's the pre-salvation heart. We call it the old man. We call it the soul man, which constantly seeks to resurrect itself. Now, your carnal heart will resist being transformed. And if your mind, your carnal heart is not repeatedly transformed, it will always overrule your spirit heart. And you'll never be able to manifest the new spirit heart in your lifestyle because, listen, that battle between those hearts, it never, ever, ever ceases. In fact, Paul described it like this in Romans 7, 14 through 21. Paul, that great apostle, that anointed apostle, that one who I believe was probably the greatest preacher, only second to Christ to walk the earth. And I believe that he tried to live what he preached. But Paul says, my spirit heart 
It desires to love and obey God. But every time I set out to do it, my old heart resurrects itself and it hinders me from that which I desire to do most. And that is to please God. You see, there is this constant spiritual warfare that goes on within all of our hearts. The war of the spirit heart and the carnal heart. The second observation I want to make about the heart is this. Our hearts can deceive us. And it, it, no one is excluded from this. All of our hearts can deceive us. And this is the one that I think we need to pay closer attention to. Jeremiah 17, 9 through 10 says this. And I'm going to read it from the NIV. It says, the heart is deceitful above all things. And it is exceedingly perverse and corrupt and severely mortally sick. Who can know it, perceive, understand, be acquainted with his own heart and mind? I, the Lord, search the mind. I try the heart, even to give man according to the fruit of his doing. And it's interesting that the Jeremiah says, who can even know their own heart? And don't we spend a lot of times, many times, trying to, to, to figure out what's in someone else's heart? And Jeremiah says the most difficult thing is to know what's in our own heart. Let's hear the Holy Spirit today. This is important. Because what it tells me is that I can be used of God, anointed to serve God, while being used by Satan simultaneously at the same time. And that's true of all of us. And the Bible tells us that Judas is proof of that. The second thing, third thing that I want to make and observe about the heart is that our life is a manifestation of the condition of our heart. Whatever your life is, take a look at your heart and you'll find out that a lot of times it's because of the condition of your heart. Number four, our heart determines our motives. Sometimes we think that motives will be driven and it'll drive our heart. What we don't understand is that actually our hearts drive our motives. The fifth observation is that we can contract heart disease at any given moment. And that's why number six, every day we need to ask God to give us new hearts. Psalm 51, 16, or rather 10, we read it on the way in. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. And so I believe that there are some steps that we can take in acquiring a new heart daily. Let me just give you one thought today about how to acquire a new heart. Quit pursuing the image of perfection. One of the reasons we fail so miserably in living holy lives is that we think that holiness is about an image. The pursuit of the image of perfection, it causes us to fail constantly. There are those in the church who make us feel like that's what we should be pursuing. When you look like me, dress like me, walk like me, talk like me, then you will be holy. Let me say that I believe that holiness affects some of the things externally. But here is the problem. If you take a hog out of the pig pen, bring it into a white house, dress it up in a white suit, put a white tie on it, put that hog on a white couch, but then all of a sudden that white dressed hog looks out the window and it sees the slop. The moment you open that door, that hog will jump off of the couch and run back to the slop. Why will it do that? Because that's its nature. And isn't that true of many of us in the body of Christ? We're trying to pursue this image of perfection when our nature has not been changed. And then the moment that the slop comes back around, sexual impurities, lies, deceit, they present themselves. We go back to our old nature. And the reason we do that is because in our pursuit of the image of perfection, we don't understand that that is temporal. And it only gives us a measure or a form of godliness with no power to back it up. Now, let me, let me just hurry along here and listen to me closely. When you operate that way, you totally miss God. Listen, I believe that we ought to give God our very best. Hear me. I'm telling you right now, I am not going to dress better for the world than I'm going to dress for my God. I'm not going to sing my heart out for the world and then come in here and give God some half-staff praise and worship. I'm not going to do what I do for the secular man with excellence and then offer God some sloppy agape. Listen. I tell the ushers all the time, if you're going to usher, do it with excellence. If you're going to teach a class for God, prepare even in excellence and then deliver in excellence. And if you're going to sing for God on this platform, don't come up here like this is the, the Mayberry RFD show with Barney Fife and Andy Griffith. Do it with excellence. 
because I believe that God is great and greatly to be praised. But with that said, listen to me. We have become a church body of people who have become constantly in pursuit of image and not of God. And when you pursue the image of perfection, we cannot connect with the heart of God. And that's why we have people doing things in the name of the Lord that just make you shake your head. I don't know about anybody else, but so many times I see people do things or I hear them say things and I go, what Bible are you reading? Because it's so far from the nature of God. And yet when they do it or say it, they're convinced that it is God. And the reason is this is that when we get caught up in this pursuit of image above perfection, we lose connection and an understanding of the heart of God. Now stay with me, because this is not as simple as it may seem. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 48, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. Jesus said, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. And we already know, you know and I know, that no one is perfect. And Jesus turns around and he tells us to do something that is humanly impossible for us to do and to be. Now, if God tells us to be it and he tells us to do it, then there must be something in the realms of possibility locked in there some way. Because Jesus, listen, he was not talking about human perfection. He was talking in the spirit. And again, he was talking about the heart here. He was saying you need to allow the spirit of God to bring your heart into perfection, into perfection. Now, you can't do that unless you begin to look at this through an eternal perspective and lens. And when you get your spirit aligned with the spirit of God, your fleshly man will submit. And the problem we see is that we're trying to know a God who is God of the spirit with our fleshly heart, our soul man, the seat of our will and our emotions, the place of our carnal knowledge. And I say, come back, Holy Spirit. And don't get me wrong. I believe that many are sincere and I believe that we really want to know God, that we're really trying to understand what God requires of us. But the problem is that we're trying to grasp these things out of the heart that is desperately wicked instead of out of a heart that's asking God daily, create in me a clean heart, give me a new heart, a spirit heart by which to pursue you and your will. And you know, it's interesting to me that I've heard Christians say we don't need to repent every day. Yes, we do. Because our hearts are so wicked that sometimes we sin and we don't even know we've sinned. And that's why David said, cleanse us from secret faults. Let me close with this. The story goes that there were some boys that were trying to see which could make the straightest track across a snowy field. Only one of them succeeded in making that straight line. When they asked him how he did it, he said, I kept my eyes fixed on the goal while you fellows kept looking at your feet. Then he said, if I keep my eyes fixed toward the Lord, I'll always walk in a straight path. I thought, my God, isn't that Hebrews 12 and 2? And don't we know it? But God convict us to do it every day. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. You do that, you'll keep a healthy heart. God bless.